Heels welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heels is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heels was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. So good morning everybody, my name is Giuseppe Passerino. I was supposed to be the first speaker. I apologize with you, but uh, unfortunately we had a car accident just in front of here. So I apologize for my delay. Uh, so uh, I, I've been working for uh, uh, many years in the field of, of uh, gen genetics and demography of uh, aging. And uh, then uh, my group and I ended up uh, with uh, epigenetics. Uh, so, uh, which probably is a way to put together different uh, uh, parts of this problem, of the problem of, of aging. So, uh, certainly, we have been dealing for a long time with aging, which is certainly uh, correlated with environmental and genetic factors. Environmental factors are pretty easy to. Uh, to understand, I mean, here, for instance, we see that uh, uh, is the evolution of life expectancy in Italy. Yes, and as you can see, it has uh, uh, improved a lot from uh, in the last century. And what we can see is that also that at the beginning, the main problem was infant mortality, which was extremely high. Then, after it has been solved the infant mortality, uh, there has also been a, a very good uh, improvement of uh, survival at, uh, uh, after the age of 65 or 70, and then this has uh, brought uh, a continuous amelioration, a, a continuous uh, uh, increase of uh, uh, life expectancy, which is uh, still going on. Uh, but uh, also uh, the genetic part uh, of uh, uh, longevity is uh, important. Uh, here in this uh, study we look at uh, uh, the families of centenarians in southern Italy. Uh, so, we, we, so these are the brothers of uh, centenarians. So all the centenarians which uh, we could uh, uh, identify in, uh, in Calabria, in southern Italy, uh, we reconstructed the families and uh, we have uh, this uh, survival curve of the brothers of centenarians. And this is the uh, survival curves of people who were born the, in 1910, that is uh, more or less the same time when, uh, when the brothers of the centenarians were born. Of course, uh, the brothers of the centenarians share with the centenarians' DNA, but also environment. And then it's possible that this is not really, uh, does not show only the genetic part of uh, longevity, but it does show also the familiar part, which is the uh, shared environmental um, family environment of the centenarians. For this reason, we reconstructed not only the brothers for the centenarians, the famous of the centenarians, but also the brother-in-law of the centenarians. That is, those who got married with the sisters of the centenarians. And as we can see, uh, there is a difference between the uh, brothers, between the cores of 1910 and Okay, so these are the court of people which are not related to the brothers of the centenarians. Here are the brothers-in-law of the centenarians. And then the difference between brothers and centenarians and brother-in-law is smaller than the general population, but still there is a difference. So it means that certainly the family environment explains part of the, the longevity 
of uh, the brothers, but not all of it. A part of the uh, survival of the brothers and sisters, which is higher than the general population, is due to genetic factors. And uh, uh, so, uh, we also studied uh, the, not only the rate of uh, aging, which is also, this means, uh, the uh, longevity, but also the quality of aging. That is, uh, uh, how well is a person at a certain age. And for this reason, we uh, studied very much the frailty, which is related very much to the homeostatic capacity of the body to uh, deal with uh, uh, the environment. The, 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 the environment, and uh, so we uh, studied an index which is based on uh, uh, these uh, feel, uh, on these uh, items uh, with these geriatric items, which uh, are able to measure indeed the homeostatic capacity of a, a person. And indeed, when we obtained this uh, uh, classification of people in fra non-frail pre-frail and frail. Uh, by following them for uh, three years, we saw that the people who were non-frail survived much more than pre-frail and uh, of uh, people who were frail. Uh, what is important to show is that when we look at, uh, at this in uh, twins, in the Danish twins, in collaboration with Corey Christensen from the University of Southern Denmark in Odense, uh, we found that the 43% uh, of a frailty, of being frailty of a certain age, is related to uh, a genetic uh, background. In other words, we, look, we saw by looking at uh, monozygotic and dizygotic twins that dizygotic twins were related to each other much more than monozygotic, sorry, monozygotic twins were related to each other much more than dizygotic twins. Uh, so uh, the genetic part, the genetic background has an importance not only for longevity but also for the quality of aging and the ability to, to keep homeostatic capacity for a longer age. Oh, now, on the basis of this, we look at, we, we look at, at uh, epigenetics, that is, uh, at, uh, the, at those changes in, uh, of uh, DNA structure which are not related to the sequence of uh, DNA, and the most important of which is certainly methylation. And uh, so we, we, we tried to understand how much epigenetics is related to aging. The first uh, experiment we did was many years ago when uh, technical, uh, technologies were much less than now. And so with a very old fashioned way, we looked at the global DNA uh, methylation index, which is an index which, is allow, which allows to, under, to uh, calculate the total, the global, I should say, uh, methylation of the DNA. Uh, basically, uh, the, the, the highest is the index, the lowest is uh, the methylation of the whole genome. And what we found was that in the population, in the total population, these are people who are older than 70 years, uh, there is a, a distribution which is pretty much normal of this index. Okay. Uh, what we saw was that people who were frail had an higher index with respect to the others. That is, higher index means a lower um, methylation of the, a lower global methylation of the genome. Uh, of course, we, uh, we wondered, does this mean that when people get frail, the um, methylation goes down or vice versa. And uh, we, we were lucky enough because uh, uh, we could see the same people after seven years from the, the, the baseline. And so what we saw was that the people who during the seven years were still non-frail or 
uh, pre frail had kept the same level of uh, global methylation index. In other words, they didn't change their uh, um, the quality of their life, I would say, the, 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 quality, the quality of their homeostatic capacity to cope with the uh, uh, environment, and they kept the, the same, uh, more or less the same uh, global methylation index. Those who, who, who had lost their homeostatic capacity had also a very strong uh, increase of their methylation index, which means they had a very lo much lower uh, methylation of uh, the uh, global genome. So this means that uh, there is uh, a loss of uh, methylation when uh, there is a frailty. Uh, we also wondered if uh, there is uh, a correlation between uh, the genetic component which uh, uh, is important for longevity and epigenetic features. Uh, for this reason, we, we st as a, in our uh, lab, we have been studying uh, for a long time mitochondrial DNA and the correlation between mitochondrial DNA and longevity. We started with the uh, uh, polymorphism of a mitochondrial DNA. And what we saw is that the distribution of, uh, uh, we tried to see if there is a uh, correlation between the distribution of uh, methylation, global methylation in the population of uh, the elderly, and uh, the variability of mitochondrial DNA. So what we saw was that uh, these uh, here are uh, different uh, uh, polymorphisms of uh, mitochondrial DNA. And what we found was that uh, uh, the, 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 the global methylation index was pretty much similar in all different, uh, uh, even if we certify the population for the variability of mitochondrial DNA. There is only one uh, haplotype, which is uh, apro haplotype, uh, which I should say haplogroup J, uh, where we saw a much lower index. Uh, a lower index, uh, I will remind, are those who were fra not frail. So those who were less frail had uh, a lower index. Uh, and in this case, it is, it is, uh, this, uh, it is uh, correlated to this uh, upper group J. And, but upper group J is not, uh, uh, was already known for, uh, was already known for being uh, uh, correlated to longevity. And we, 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 we had uh, uh, additional experiments uh, to, to try to, to, to confirm this uh, uh, result by, by studying cybrids. Cybrid cells are cells which where uh, mitochondrial DNA has been uh, uh, deleted uh, and then uh, it, it has been repopulated with different kinds of mitochondrial DNA. This allowed to have different lineages with the same uh, nuclear genome, but a different kind of mitochondrial DNA. So what we see is due not to nuclear variability, but to mitochondrial variability. And what we found, again, was that even in these cells, upper group J had a lower global methylation index with respect to the others. So uh, my, um, upper group J, that is a, a polymorphism which is correlated to longevity, is also correlated to the, to the ability of the genome to keep its uh, uh, global methylation, which on turn is correlated to the, the, the ability to keep homeostasis. Uh, okay, so the, 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 from that point on, the, there have been different studies which have tried to uh, understand better, more in detail, with uh, more sophisticated techniques, the correlation there is between epigenetics uh, and uh, aging. In particular, uh, many, uh, many studies have been to try to understand if it's possible to to find uh, sites in specific genes which have a, a, a characteristic feature during age, which allow to sort of pinpoint and to measure 
the, the aging uh, process. In particular, uh, in uh, this uh, gene, ELOF2, ELOF is a, a gene uh, where there is a very strict correlation uh, between age and uh, uh, methylation. Uh, the correlation is so strong that uh, there, the, it is, uh, there are studies now to use it for forensic in order to uh, understand the age of a certain person when it is not clear from other sources. Uh, but uh, also uh, a, a very important uh, uh, step forward in this field has been done uh, by Steve Horvath, who has uh, studied uh, 300 different uh, uh, 322 different genes, uh, uh, which are very, very um, sensitive in giving the chronological age of a certain person. And uh, he, he has done this in different tissues, and uh, the, the, he, he found out that uh, uh, they are extremely good in uh, giving uh, an um, the, the age, the precise age of a person. However, uh, a few years ago, Claudio Franceschi, I, and uh, uh, Daniela Mari in Milan uh, collected uh, um, almost 100 people who were older than 105 years. So uh, semi-super centenarians, they are called. So they, are, they have a very extreme phenotype. They are extremely special persons. And uh, so we uh, collaborated with Steve Horvath uh, in order to find out if these persons, uh, it was possible for, with the molecular, the epigenetic clock he had set up to understand the age of these persons. In other words, if they have a, a sort of uh, um, a methylation which can say, tell us that they are 105. So here is uh, what he found out. Here are our semi supercentenarians, so people who are 105 and older, it, it goes from 105 to 110, uh, actually 112. And as you can see, here are all the other persons, all the other samples he had analyzed, and you see that this black line is the line that you obtain by, by looking to the, to the general population. This is the line you obtain by putting in, in the picture also the semi-supercentenarians. In other words, semi-supercentenarians look to be at least 20, 25 years younger than uh, it would be expected on the basis of the, of the epigenetic clock. And what is more important is that uh, this is true also for the children of semi-supercentenarians. So it's not only semi-supercentenarians semi -super who look younger than their age with the epigenetic clock, but also the children of the, of, of the semi-supercentenarians look much younger. So, these molecular clocks are very good, extremely sensitive, but there are subjects which have something special, which allow them to sort of uh, uh, decrease the, uh, the, 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 the speed of, of this molecular clock, this epigenetic clock. So it is a, certainly a, a measure of chronological age, but there is a way to modulate it and semi supercentenarians these people with this very extreme phenotype have found the way to modulate it uh, other uh, another important issue uh, uh, which i would like to bring in is the study of methylation within uh, mitochondrial dna uh, in particular uh, we found a site uh, which is at the position 932 of uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is uh, methylated. Uh, the met uh, met uh, methylation, which uh, can be uh, at a different level, uh, here it is, that's it. 
and here is the distribution of the methylation. In most cases, the methylation of this site is below 10%. So the 10% of the, of the whole molecules are methylated, 90% are not. Uh, there are just a few ones, a few ones who have a, a higher methylation uh, um, percentage uh, than 10%. And here's the distribution within the population with respect to the age. And what is important is that uh, we had a chance to follow these persons for about 10 years, nine years to be precise. And what we found is, was that people who, were, uh, who had a higher percentage of uh, uh, methylation were, had a risk of mortality within nine years, which was 2.5 fold more than the rest of the population. In other words, to have a, a, met, a higher methylation percentage of this site is a, a risk factor uh, very important, which uh, more than double the, the chance of dying in the next nine years. Uh, also, very important, uh, another important uh, site that we found uh, is uh, this uh, ribos uh, ribosoma RNA promoter. Uh, that is, uh, here we found many different sites which have a different uh, variable level of polymorphism, of uh, methylation, sorry. Uh, in particular, this one, CPG number five, has a, a very variable uh, level of methylation in the population. But uh, what is important is that we had a chance, also in this case, uh, to follow people uh, in the next uh, 10 years. And this is the, what we found. Here uh, uh, are the people which, where, where the methylation is uh, higher than 10%, and they survive much more than people which have a, a, a methylation level with lower, which is lower than 10%. Uh, I want to point out that before, people were at risk, at higher risk, were people with higher level of methylation. Here are those with lower level of methylation. So while before, when we had less technical uh, abilities, we could just see that there is a, a very rough higher or lower uh, um, uh, methylation, we have now to go forward and to say that there, is, there are very, very sophisticated ways of modulating uh, the, uh, um, the methylation profile, which, is, uh, which has a certainly a, a rough uh, methylation which is, uh, goes up and down. But then there are the specific, very specific uh, uh, sites which uh, can be methylated or demethylated in, res in response to specific uh, pressure of uh, the, 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 the organism. In particular, what it seems very important is uh, the, uh, the, the, the homostatic capacity, which uh, has a, a sort of, of uh, uh, which brings to a sort of um, remodeling of the methylation, which needs to be uh, studied very closely because it is very finely uh, modulated. Uh, so, what we, indeed, what we found is exactly that uh, it is possible, probably, to use uh, um, epigenetics as uh, uh, biomarkers of aging to follow the aging. But probably, uh, if we understand better how the, 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 these modulations occur, how this correlation between longevity, between the frailty and the epigenetics occurs, we, we can probably modulate these aspects and then to modulate aging. In particular, uh, one issue we are very much studying closely uh, is uh, the, uh, the use of uh, animal proteins because we have data, but we're not all us, there are many, we have data that uh, anim the use of animal proteins has uh, a very strong impact on epigenome. 
and, uh, and now we are studying very closely the Italian population because the Italian population had a very uh, peculiar story because there has been a very uh, important increase of animal proteins after the 1950, which has been very strong. And uh, so uh, we would like to see how this has impacted the, the metalome of Italians. How? Uh, the, this, uh, this is uh, the, 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 the total of the animal proteins in Italy on the whole. But uh, it, it has been done in different, in different time. Here, uh, and in particular in, in the northern Italy, it started almost uh, 15, 20 years before than in southern Italy. This is uh, very important, uh, this very strong uh, increase of animal proteins. And this is uh, witnessed very, very well by the hate of the Italians. In other words, uh, here in, uh, uh, in 1950s, the hate of uh, northern Italians went down almost 10 centimeters more with respect to, to before. And this was, in fact, due to the, uh, to the use, the much higher use of animal proteins with respect to before. This very strong increase of hate occurred in southern Italy almost 15, 20 years later, exactly because the, the consumption of animal proteins started 15, 20 years later. So we want to try to understand how the different uh, age where uh, the people were uh, exposed to animal proteins has uh, um, um, changed the, methyl the methylation profile of people who were already born at the time or of people who were born at the time because, of course, as you know, uh, the, the, the diet of uh, pregnant women does uh, uh, influence the methylation profile of uh, uh, newborns. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, wonderful presentation. Uh, has there been a data that um, interventions leading to demethylations are beneficial to health? No. no, no, no. Even lifestyle? <laughs> Well, because the problem is not, not that the methylation is good and methylation is, is uh, worse. There are specific methylation. It's not a matter of uh, a quantity, but uh, probably a little bit, but it's mainly a, a matter of quality. Indeed, what we saw at the beginning, that there is a, a lower methylation in the frailty, it probably doesn't mean that there is a, I mean, there is a lower methylation, but this is because the, 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 the organism which is going to have a, a loss of meiosis tries to respond with a, 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 a remodeling, and then there is a lower methylation in global, but to methylate specifically some uh, specific places, some specific, specific promoters, then it is not a matter just of going down, but of remodeling and, uh, and to methylate precisely some specific genes. And that's why we find, we find that in uh, frailty there are specific genes which are more methylated and others which are less methylated. Uh, 